All right, hopefully you, you can, ah, there, good. You can hear me? I, uh, wow, I'm delighted to see the terrific turnout today. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, for those of you that are in this audience, uh, you should also know that we're uh, also video casting this to our colleagues in Evanston so that they're also participating uh, via the video cast. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the Center for Genetic Medicine and the Lectures in Life Sciences of the IGP, uh, we're really pleased to welcome you all to the uh, 19, uh, 2007 Richard A. Scott Lecture. Um, I'll just say a couple of words uh, about uh, Dr. Scott before we uh, have the introduction of our speaker. Uh, the lecture series was established uh, by a bequest uh, provided by the family um, for Richard Scott, who graduated from Northwestern University Medical School in 1968. Uh, he had a long and distinguished career in research, teaching, and education, uh, but was passionate in particular about education, and it was that passion that the family is trying to honor uh, by establishing the endowment that supports this lecture. Uh, we're fortunate to have Mrs. Scott and some of her friends and family in the audience today, and we welcome you and uh, hope you enjoy the lecture. So uh, without any further ado, I will turn the podium over to uh, Dr. Lee Ming Lee, who will introduce our speaker today. Hello. Thank you, Rex. Um, this is really my great honor to be here to introduce Dr. Susan Inquist as today's uh, Scott, Scott lecture and our speaker. I really think it's uh, me, and rather Sue, is to be introduced. For those who do, you know, who do not know me, my name is Lee Min Ni. I'm an assistant professor at the, the uh, Department of Molecular, Molecular Pharmacology and Biochemistry, oh, Biological Chemistry, I'm sorry. So um, it's uh, uh, really difficult to summarize Sue's more than 20 pages of CV into a few sentences, as you can imagine. But I'll give it a try. So Sue actually got her BA in microbiology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with high honors. And uh, she went to Harvard University, did a PhD with Dr. Matthews uh, Mason. So then, she uh, came to Chicago, did a postdoc with Dr. Swift. And then she stayed on, arising from assistant and associate to full professor at the University of Chicago. And then there, and she became a Howard Hughes investigator and a Albert Lasker uh, um, a professor in uh, medical sciences. And then she uh, went to uh, MIT in 2001 there, she became the first female director of Whitehead uh, Institute. Uh, then she uh, is currently a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and a member of Whitehead Institute and a professor uh, in biology at MIT. So throughout her 30 years career, made great, many, many great contributions uh, to the uh, biological sciences. She's a pioneer in protein folding and the molecular chaperones, as many of you know. And uh, she uses this tiny unicellular organism called budding yeast. In my own lab, we study that. Uh, her lab has produced uh, many convincing evidence supporting the protein only protein hypothesis. Although her major interest or central interest the protein folding, her research actually covered a diverse uh, areas from prion biology, evolutionary biology, to nanotechnology. So uh, she has uh, made so many contributions, had many, many, many honors and awards. I really cannot name them all because uh, you have no time left for her lecture. So um, I will just uh, tell you a, little, a, a few of them. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1996. She was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1997. She was named one of the 50 most important women in science by Discover Magazine in 2002. 
and she's currently a member of Cold Spring Harbor Lab Board of Trustees, a member of Stowers Institute for Medical Research Scientific Advisory Board, a member of Hereditary Disease Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. Sue is an extraordinary mentor. She has trained many students and postdocs around the world. And uh, many of them now become very successful scientists and leaders in their own fields. I was very fortunate to be able to work with her in, uh, for several years in her laboratory as a postdoctoral fellow in University of Chicago. Her love in science, her extraordinary creativity and insight has really strongly impacted me, influenced me. So I also want to tell you she's not only an excellent scientist, but also a caring daughter, a passionate mother of two lovely girls. She is really, I think, a perfect role model for young women scientists who want to have both family and career. So we are very fortunate to have Sue to be here to give us this important Scott lecture and OS series lecture. So her title is Using Simple Cells to Unlock Complex Secrets of Biology. Welcome, Sue. Thanks for all those kind, lovely remarks, and thank you all for coming. And I also want to thank uh, the family that endowed this lecture. I've, I've just met Anne, and uh, it's uh, really important to educational institutions that Americans uh, have a philanthropic spirit, and they care about educational systems. And so uh, this lecture is just one example, but it's, it's in a very important one. I just want to thank the family for what they've done for Northwestern. So, um, as Li Ming said, I, I study quite often these simple cells. We actually work on lots of different organisms in my lab, uh, but these uh, very simple organisms here, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, are just amazingly useful organisms. And we can manipulate them genetically in ways we can't even begin to dream manipulating other organisms. And so, that allows us to take advantage of something really remarkable that's unfolded over the last 30 years or so of biology when I've been doing my research, something we certainly didn't expect when I started my research, and that is that the biology of these organisms here is actually remarkably like the biology of these organisms over here. Uh, it's astonishing, uh, not only in terms of, oh, they all have the same ribosomes and they all have the same method of decoding DNA, but um, there's all sorts of complex uh, subcellular organizations and protein trafficking and mitochondria, uh, all sorts of specializations and responses to environments and things like that that really are remarkably simple, so, similar. So that really allows us this tremendous opportunity to use these guys here as entree points to understand some very important problems for these guys over here. And the problems that I work on uh, involve protein folding. So the basic problem of protein folding is very simple. Uh, the information that codes for proteins is linear. It's DNA. But, um, and virtually all of the functions in our body are due to proteins. Uh, and those proteins, when they're first decoded from that linear code of the DNA, are also linear. They're long strings of amino acids. And they're absolutely useless as long strings of amino acids. In order for them to function, they have to fold into these incredibly complicated, and, and as a biochemist, I think really beautiful shapes. Um, this is hemoglobin, something very familiar to you. It carries oxygen around in our blood, and it can't do that at all unless that molecule, this very long, complicated molecule, folds up into just the right, right shape. And here's green fluorescent protein, which we take advantage of uh, a lot in biology. It glows green when you shine blue light on it. Uh, and uh, this molecule also just cannot perform that function unless it's folded very, 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 very precisely. And the reason why this is a problem in biological systems is very simple. It's really crowded in the cell. 
it's absolutely ridiculous for proteins to have to fold in that environment. It's, it's just absurd. The reason why cells do this is because, of course, once proteins do get folded, uh, it's, it's really great because then you can get tremendous efficiencies. You can even you can transmit a, an electron from one protein to the other because things are so packed together inside the cell. But getting proteins folded properly in that environment, when before they've even finished being synthesized, they've been bombarded by at least a million other proteins colliding into them with really a high level of kinetic energy. It, it's just you know an impossible situation. So when you think about proteins going about their business inside living cells, it's not like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. It's much more uh, like the characters in a Marx Brothers movie where chaos is poised on the precipice of disaster. So we've had some problems with the sound system, but I hope you got to hear the sounds back there. Um, that's actually happening inside of our cells all the time. That's what we call in the protein folding world going off pathway. And uh, in fact, cell proteins are constantly doing this. We're constantly having mistakes made. And the cells devote actually a tremendous amount of energy to preventing that from happening, to uh, taking apart the problems once they do, do occur, taking apart the protein aggregates. And when they can't get rid of the protein aggregates, when they can't get the proteins to refold, then they just play and figure out a variety of different ways by which they can get rid of those proteins. So there's a constant load on all cells all of the time of this thing happening. And it turns out that this is, as I mentioned, very, very deeply rooted in biological systems. It's so deeply rooted in biological systems that we think it really profoundly influences the way organisms evolve. And that's one of the things I'll be telling you a little, just a little bit about today. But uh, in addition to that, I, I want to uh, mention to you that this, this deeply rooted problem in biology, which is as ancient as life itself, uh, means that the problems and the solution to the problems have been conserved across all organisms. Amazing conservation of these systems. Uh, so if it's a complicated problem, and this protein folding problem is a complicated problem, our idea is to uh, find the simplest place to start and then move around a lot. So we often start in yeast. We then wind up moving into plants. We wind up moving into mice. We wind up moving into fruit flies whatever, but uh, this is a wonderful place to start. So I'm going to start out by telling you a story about HSP90 and yeast. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, HSP90 and yeast. So it, it turns out that you know, about 25 years ago or so, it became apparent that when cells are exposed to high temperatures or an extraordinary variety of other types of stresses, they made as a sort of emergency response a small number of new proteins called the heat shock proteins. And so HSP90 is a heat shock protein. HSP90, it's 90 kilodaltons. And we had no clue what these things were doing. Uh, I started studying them initially because it was a phenomenal system for looking at gene regulation because the cell went full tilt boogie and did everything it possibly could uh, to make these proteins. But what in God's name were they doing? Well, we decided to switch into yeast cells at that point because in yeast cells it had just been developed methods for being able to knock out any gene you wanted. So if you had the gene that encoded a sequence for a particular protein, you could make a surgical strike and knock that gene out and then see well, what, what happens to the cell if you don't make that protein. And so we did that with these heat shock proteins. And for HSP90, we found that it was a very, very abundant protein normally. We had lots and lots of it in the cell. In fact, it's about 1% to 2% of total cell protein, not only in yeast, but in you guys as well. We found that it was essential for life, so if you kn knocked it out, the cells died. And that was really comforting, uh, because we, now we're working on an important problem. Uh, except it provided us with absolutely no information whatsoever about what was going wrong. The dead cells tell no tales. Uh, we went on to show that we could reduce the levels of HSP90 by playing with the regulatory sequences, 
And, and in fact, it, the cells didn't matter, didn't mind it at all if, if you reduced it. You could reduce it 10 to 20 fold and, and they were just fine. Um, but they, uh, because it seems to be acting as a buffer, you have more of it than you need. But it's induced by heat, as I mentioned to begin with. And in fact, under conditions of stress, you need all of that protein that's being made. So it's not needed very much at low temperatures, but you need uh, buckets of it at higher temperatures or under a variety of all kinds of other stresses. But what's it doing? That did this, all these experiments, this nice, elegant ability to genetically manipulate yeast really told us pretty much nothing about that. So very fortunately, it turned out that about the time we were doing these experiments, uh, several other laboratories bumped into HSP90 completely by accident. They were not the least bit interested in the heat shock response. They were interested in all sorts of other things. For example, they were interested in how steroid hormone receptors uh, are activated and controlled. They were interested in how certain oncogenic tyrosine kinases, proteins that cause cancer uh, when they're mutated, how, how do they cause cancer? And it turned out that when they used antibodies to fish those proteins out of mammalian cells, HSP90 came along for the ride. So, but they had no clue what it was doing. And as they started to look at, at what was happening was that well, whenever they fished ate this, these complexes out of cells, the complexes that were bound to HSP90 were inactive. But if they did something else to activate the proteins, for example, with glucocorticoid receptor or estrogen receptor or androgen receptor, just add the hormone, activates the, the, the receptor, and then it turns out HSP90 is no longer bound to it. Or the oncogenic kinases just gave them time to mature. They're activated, HSP90 was no longer bound to it. So, uh, it was a very simple, um, th simple thing to suggest that what HSP90 was doing is just acting as a repressor for, for these uh, various proteins. So here we have, for example, newly made V-SARC. SARC is the first oncogene, ever, oncoprotein ever uh, described. Um, and that the idea was that HSP90 is repressing it. And then later, when it becomes mature and activated as a kinase and, and does its damage to cells in terms of... Uh, oncogenic transformation by telling them to grow, 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 grow when they're not supposed to be growing, um, that, that it was no longer complex with HSP90. So there's a very simple experiment we can do now in yeast cells. It's very hard, actually. This v, these VSARC proteins are, are, are very unstable, floppy proteins. They were very difficult to purify from E. coli or from mammalian cells. Um, the complexes with HSP90, actually, I've oversimplified it. I'm just showing HSP90, but it turns out that there's all kinds of other proteins involved in those complexes. And it's really very difficult to recreate that inside a test tube. And so what we did was take advantage of yeast cells as living test tubes, and we simply used strains that we had genetically reduced the expression of HSP90. So if HSP90 is a repressor and you reduce its expression, you should expect the protein to become much more active. Very simple test. So we put the, we put the VSARC protein into yeast cells. And here we can take advantage of the fact that yeast cells love sugar. And in fact, we take advantage of the fact that yeast cells love sugar all the time. And I think we're going to be having some wine at the reception that is an example of our taking advantage of the fact that yeast cells love sugars. But yeast cells discriminate between all kinds of different sugars. And for example, if they're growing in glucose, um, they're, they're expressing certain types of proteins. If they're growing, if you give them galactose, it will very quickly turn on a gene that, involved, that has that galactose regulatory sequence. So we put VSARC, this oncogenic kinase, under the control of a galactose-inducible promoter. It was completely off, and then we put the cells into galactose to turn it on. And we put it into two different cell types, the cells that have normal levels of HSP90 and the cells that have low levels of HSP90. And this just shows you, this is the low levels, this is wild type and normal levels. This just shows you the accumulation using a simple antibody on a western blot, how much SARC is accumulating, pretty much the same. So transcription's pretty much the same, translation's pretty much the same. Um, there's a little bit of turnover of the VSARC protein at, under these conditions, but not very big deal. Then we can say, okay, well, what's the activity of this protein? Is the protein much more active when HSP90 levels are reduced? And the answer we got was completely opposite of expectation. When HSP90 levels were reduced, not only was it not more active, it was completely dead as a doornail. So HSP90 is actually required for this protein to get activated. And 
we then looked and compared HSP90's uh, effect on VSARC with its effect on CSARC, the normal cellular form, the non-oncogenic form of the kinase. And we can see that there's a little bit of effect of HSP90, but it doesn't matter very much at all to that particular protein. And we looked at other kinases too, and they, they, many of them it didn't matter. So very specifically for this mutated oncogenic kinase, HSP90 is empowering that kinase to have activity. We now have a, a more complete version of this because in fact, uh, very close to the time when we were doing these experiments, uh, William Pratt's laboratory took advantage of reticulocyte lysates to do simple, similar things biochemically. Those are also complex lysates that have lots of different things in them that, that uh, supplied the various cofactors that HSP90 needed. So what it has turned out to be is that it, the C-SARC kinase normally sits at the membrane and it folds up on itself and it inhibits itself. And it only every once in a while receives other signals from the cell that will tell it to signal uh, and, and, and cause things to, cells to grow. The oncogenic mutation, the cancer-causing mutation, actually clips the protein right here and removes this thing which normally keeps it inhibited. So it unfolds. But it unfolds and it's completely unstable. HSP90 binds to it. And yes, while it's complex with HSP90, the protein is repressed. So that, that initial result was absolutely true. But the reason it's binding to HSP90 is it's not to SARC is not to keep it repressed, but to help it mature and help it to get activated in the first place so that it can then signal for cells to grow. Okay, so this is yeast cells. Well, come on. Does this, at this time you did this experiment, a lot of people thought, well, how could anything you do in yeast cells really tell you anything about what's going on in, in a mammal? And luckily, shortly after we did that work, Luke Whitesell, uh, who's been a long-term uh, friend and, and colleague, uh, decided to look at what happens when you inhibit HSP90 uh, in cells that are transformed into the oncogenic state by VSARC. So these cells, for those of you in the audience who are used to looking at these things, these are very abnormal looking cells. Um, these cells have lost contact inhibition. They're just growing like crazy. They're ignoring the normal signals to stop growing. Uh, there is a cancerous sort of state. So Luke found an inhibitor for HSP90. He was the first person to identify a drug inhibitor for HSP90. And he simply added that drug to the cells and asked, well, what would happen to VSARC activity in those cells when I inhibit it? And it turns out that the cells completely reverted to normal. Uh, they, they showed contact inhibition. They flattened out. They behaved themselves. So just as we had found in yeast, in mammalian cells too, HSP90 doesn't, doesn't act as a repressor of SARC activity. It acts to activate SARC, and when you repress HSP90 levels, then SARC is no longer active. This has turned out to be the case for many, many other oncogenic uh, tyrosine kinases and other kinases as well. Many other cancer-causing proteins, it turns out, are proteins that have acquired new mutations, which give them new activities, but those mutations also make those proteins inherently unstable and vulnerable to be getting turned over and degraded and gotten rid of by the cell, and also vulnerable to accumulating in big aggregated messes where they're not functional. HSP90 is very, very important for these proteins. It, it, the, these proteins subvert the normal uh, systems of the cell, HSP90, they use HSP90 to get themselves activated and, and turn the states towards cancerous growth. So, and, I'm, so, and this pro profile just shows an example of the fact that there are a lot of HSP90 inhibitor trials now that are based upon the fact that uh, there are many different, many different targets in the cells and many different tumors that seem to be depending upon HSP90. So there's a lot of hope that maybe by acting on some very common factor that's involved in, in, in the maturation of proteins that are important in many cancers, uh, we might be able to do something about cancer in, in a much more surgical way. However, I have to warn you that I think that there's a lot of other ways in which HSP90 influences the evolution of cells and the evolution of traits, and I don't think the story is going to be anywhere near quite as simple as this. So um, we now know that HSP90 not only matures these mutated proteins that can cause cancer, it matures, as I mentioned earlier, uh, proteins like glucocorticoid receptor, androgen receptor, estrogen receptor, all those proteins too. Uh, those are normal cellular proteins, and it, it turned out in collaboration with uh, Keith Yamamoto's group 
we'd found a very simpler, similar story. We put glucocorticoid receptor into yeast cells, and it functions just fine. It acts as a transcription factor. It turns on the genes it's supposed to turn on, the promoters it's supposed to turn on. But if you reduce HSP90 levels, the glucocorticoid receptor doesn't function. We now know that there's lots and lots of other proteins that depend upon HSP90 for cell growth, cell cycle progression, activation and repression of gene expression, uh, cell death pathways, apoptosis, development and morphogenesis, responses to environment. And the general theme, this is really over, oversimplifying it, but this, there is a sort of a general theme for these interactions. And it's basically that there are certain proteins in the cell that are meant to not quite finish folding until they get some particular signal that it's time to go and time to be active. HSP90 binds those proteins, keeps them inactive, but also keeps them activatable. So that, for example, this protein won't be active until it gets its proper partner protein is made, and that helps it to finish folding. This protein is not com completely finishing folding until it binds a steroid, for example, a steroid hormone, uh, which helps it to finish folding. This protein isn't, doesn't finish protein folding until it gets modified in a certain way that would help it to finish folding. Um, so where does HSP90 function in the cell? Well, if you look at a single transduction diagram uh, and look at all these different inputs and outputs that feed into the cell that tell the cell to grow or divide or to change its shape or do something different, and you ask where on the signaling diagram does HSP90 function? Where are its client proteins? It's all over the place. So it probably matures only about 1% to 2% of the proteins in the cell, unlike some of the other chaperones you might have heard about, like HSP70 or HSP60. Uh, HSP90 really has a very specialized class of client proteins. But when you look at things that are important in the cell, you see it all over the place because it's specialized for these particular proteins that are involved in the regulation of circuitries, the regulation of what both cells are supposed to do. And here's just another example with the insulin receptor pathway. Those are the proteins in that pathway that HSP90 functions on. So this means that HSP90 is uh, very deeply rooted in biology of all organisms. And we think it's so deeply rooted that it, that it really fundamentally influences the way organisms evolve. And I've just showed you one way. It, mu newly mutated proteins depend upon HSP90 to acquire their new activities. That's one way. I'm going to show you one other way that uh, HSP90 helps organisms to evolve. And if anybody's interested in this, we, we know of at least two other mechanisms that are really quite different and a little bit more complicated. But the next story I'd like to talk to you about in terms of, of the evolution of new traits is the evolution of drug resistance in fungi. We're really interested in this problem of evolution and how organisms acquire new traits. And we're interested in the role of protein folding in that. We decided to pick drug resistance as a good place to look. Because first of all, we can study it very well in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that organism I really love to, to work with. But also because other people have devised a lot of tools to study this problem in, in fungi. Because it's an important problem both uh, in, human, in, in human biology and medicine. It's also a por very important problem economically for us because fungal uh, pests are, are really a, a devastating problem in, in both uh, animal husbandry and in agriculture. So these are the three different yeasts that we, this three different fungi that we've worked on. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, this is Candida albicans, and this is Aspergillus. And I'm just going to talk to you about these two guys right now. We asked whether HSP90 would have an influence on the evolution of drug resistance in a very simple way. I told you that you can reduce HSP90 levels in normal cells just, just fine, and they don't, they don't mind. You can't get rid of all of it, because it's essential. But it, under normal circumstances, you can reduce it quite a bit, and they, they couldn't care less. Um, so we just asked whether fungi, Saccharomyces cerevisiae could evolve drug resistance, resistance to a very, very commonly used drug, fluconazole, the azoles are one of the very major classes of antifungal uh, fungal drugs. And we asked whether or not it would make any difference whether the cells had a, a little bit of inhibition of HSP90. And this is what happened. We plated the same number of cells on both of these plates on a drug called fluconazole. 
And you can see that there's all kinds of colonies coming up here that are resistant to the fluconazole. But when HSP90 was modestly inhibited, absolutely nothing came up. So we then asked, OK, is it just that you need this HSP90 in order for the cells to cope with the, the stress of that immediate first, uh, first plating onto, onto a drug that contain, uh, to a plate that contains the drug? And we did that genetically. We were able to actually um, take these resistant mutants here and then genetically go in and turn down HSP90. And we found, no, even, even cells that have full-blown resistance to fluconazole have already have developed that resistance. If you turn down the levels of HSP90 in them, they're dead. And in fact, what's really interesting is that H, reducing HSP90 turns this particular drug from being fungistatic to being fungicidal. We did a lot of work on this taking advantage of the genetics of yeast, and I'm not going to uh, bore you with all of that. But I'll just tell you the basic, uh, the basic findings that we, we came through with a series of little cartoons. So what this drug does is take advantage of the fact that uh, one difference between fungi and us is that they use ergosterol in their membranes instead of cholesterol. And one of the difficulties of finding antifungals is, in fact, that other interesting thing I told you in the beginning is that their biology of fungi is so similar to our biology, it's hard to find things that are, that are really particular and peculiar to fungi that you can go after. This is one of them. So there's a pathway for ergosterol synthesis. And the azoles hit this enzyme right here. And what that does is it stops the pathway. You accumulate a different sterol. And that's toxic, and the cells can't grow. So one of the most common mechanisms of resistance is for the cells to, to come up with a mutation that stops the pathway even earlier. Now you accumulate a different sterol, and that one's OK, except it turned out that, that one's only OK because the cells have, are using HSP90 to re-sculpt the entire circuitry of the cell to, to allow them to respond to the fact that their membranes are not normal. They're not the normal membranes they're used to coping with. HSP90 empowers the circuitry that will allow them to live with these changes in their membrane. So when you reduce HSP90, they can't live. So is this HSP90 only important for this one particular mechanism of evolving drug resistance? Well, we took advantage of the fact, again, of the fact that somebody else had done a wonderful uh, screen, genome-wide screen of every gene in the yeast genome that can mutate to produce uh, drug resistance in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this is James Anderson's uh, research. And what he found was he identified all of these genes. When you, they're knocked out or mutated, um, the cells will be, will be able to survive in the presence of fluconazole. As you can see, some of, them, some of the mutations are more effective than others, uh, but they all work quite well. So then we asked, well, what would happen for each of these different mechanisms of resistance if you reduce HSP90 levels? And to do this, we used two different drugs. Uh, we used a drug called gildenomycin and a drug called radicicol. What's really nice about this is that these drugs are completely different drugs. They look completely differently. They're metabolized completely differently. They both have the same very high degree of specificity for HSP90 as a target. So when we see the same effect with both of these very different drugs, we're fairly confident it involves HSP90. And that's very important to us because we take advantage of that with organisms like Candida, which don't have good genetics all the time. Here it's easy to actually, in Cerevisiae, to actually confirm this by making a mutation that reduces HSP90 expression, which we did. But I'll just show you the results with these two drugs. You can see that. As I mentioned before, we're using a concentration of this HSP90 inhibitor that doesn't hurt the cells at all. Uh, the, the, um, so each, each of these mutants is perfectly fine in the presence of inhibition of HSP90. They grow just fine. But in the presence of fluconazole, every single one of these mutants, except going way down here to the drug pump, the resistance is completely abrogated when HSP90 levels are reduced. So this one particular mechanism of uh, evolving a resistance against a drug, and that's uh, inducing a drug pump, 
uh, does not, cannot be affected by HSP90, but all of the others were. Yeah, thank you. I was looking around for my water. Thank you very much. So, next we went to candida albicans. Same thing. Plate candida albicans out on fluconazole, all kinds of resistant colonies arise. Plate them out under conditions of very modest inhibition of HSP90 that normally wouldn't bother them at all. Zip. No resistance evolves. The reason this was really cool was that we were able then to take advantage of another set of resources and actually look at, at, at real-time evolution in a human host and ask whether this mechanism is actually out there in fungi that are learning to evolve and develop drug resistance in a patient that's being treated for a fungal infection. So uh, in this case, we took advantage of the fact that Ted White had um, isolated candida albicans again and again over the course of two years while this patient was being treated uh, with a variety of different antifungal drugs to try to beat back. Actually, it wasn't this patient. In the interest of, of, um, of uh, patient privacy, you might imagine that I've not shown you the real patient. I've actually just gone off to the web and gotten a, a generic picture of a doctor patient. That's what I'm showing you here. But anyway, there was a patient uh, who, who uh, had suffered grievously from, a, from fungal infections over the course of two years. He was an AIDS patient, and he eventually succumbed to the uh, infection. And in fact, for candida albicans infections, the numbers are something like 30 to 50 percent of all immunocompromised people who get a candida albicans infection will wind up succumbing to it. For aspergillus, it's even worse. Um, so what we did was a look at whether or not the drug resistance that was occurring in those strains isolated from the patient depended upon HSP90. So this is our laboratory strain, and what I've got here is a whole lot of data, a whole lot of growth curves, et cetera, condensed into a very, I hope, simple, easy to, to look at format. Rather than, rather than all kinds of graphs and stuff, what I'm going to show you is just, just a heat map. So basically, what we've got here is in, in every row, we have a different strain of, of this fungus. And uh, in every column, we have a different concentration of fluconazole. So, um, as you can see, our lab strain and all of the strains are growing perfectly fine without any drug. Zero drug, very, very green, indicates growth. Black indicates no growth. Colors in between indicate different degrees of growth. And you can see that our lab strain is very sensitive to fluconazole. Even at the lowest concentration, our lab strain dies. But the isolates from the patient even the very first isolate that was, was gotten out of this patient, um, they were really quite resistant. They grew up to even high concentrations of fluconazole. So was this naturally occurring drug resistant in, resistance evolving in this patient dependent upon HSP90? Add the inhibitor, and I won't show you the results with radicicol, but they were identical. And as you can see, we completely abrogated the drug resistance in these strains. Uh, until the very, very end point at which the cells had evolved more and more and more and more and more and more mechanisms for drug resistance. Even in this case, however, they were still resistant uh, to the highest concentrations of the drug in the presence of the combination therapy with HSP90. Interestingly, in terms of how HSP90, this HSP90 system in which it helps organisms to evolve new traits, might be interfacing with the environment in naturally evolving biological systems, we asked what would happen if instead of inhibiting HSP90 directly, we simply grew the cells at slightly higher temperatures, which we know stresses the HSP90 system. Remember I told you that you need much more HSP90 to cope with high temperatures and stress. Whoops, I've got one more thing in here. I'm going to skip that because it's not necessary. Um, what happens when you compromise the system with high temperatures? is that also completely eliminates the drug resistance in these fungi. So we think that this is kind of interesting. This might get to some of the aspects of the mechanisms for why organisms amount high fevers when they're trying to protect themselves uh, against uh, pathogens that have invaded themselves, that it produces an extra stress on the pathogen in terms of the pathogen systems for trying to evolve resistance. 
But at any rate, we think that these are parts of the selective pressure that may be operating on these cells to constantly help them to evolve more and more pathways that will give them resistance that are no longer dependent upon HSP90. So that's one story that has to do with protein folding. And I just want to introduce the people who did this work. This is Kathy Borkovich. And Debbie Nathan started the genetic analysis of HSP90 in yeast. Um, Didier Picard and Keith Yamamoto did the work on glucocorticoid receptor. Yang Zhu and Mike Singer, who I unfortunately don't have pictures of these folks, uh, did the work on VSARC. This is Luke Whitesell, who did the mammalian work on VSARC. And this is Leah Cohen, who did all of that wonderful work on, um, on fungal drug resistance. So basically, we've gotten the idea that we can really use yeast cells as sort of living test tubes to really study some complicated problems. You know, how protein circuitry can be sculpted and shaped in this incredibly crowded environment of living cell. And in fact, we actually think we might be able to use it to study some other problems that are relevant to human biology and disease, namely neurodegenerative disease. Believe it or not, we're actually also using it to study uh, a one aspect of the process of learning and memory, but don't have time to tell you about that today. Anyway, why would we get the idea that we could possibly study something like a neurodegenerative disease in a yeast cell? I mean, after all, a yeast cell is pretty far from a neuron. The reason is because there is one thing that's in common amongst all of these neurodegenerative diseases, and this is just a sampling of them. Uh, this is Alzheimer's, uh, frontal temporal dementia, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS, the Gehrig's disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or the prion diseases. And what you see are these big brown globs here are aggregated proteins. So a hallmark of all of these diseases is protein aggregation. We don't know yet quite in many of these cases whether the big aggregates are responsible for the disease or just a hallmark of the disease. In fact, a lot of people are beginning to think um, that they're the downstream product of, that, of an earlier misfolding event, and it's an earlier misfolding event that's what's causing the toxicity. But in any case, they're all protein folding diseases. And they're all awfully difficult to study. So we're actually working on several of these in yeast. And I'm only going to tell you about one of them. I'm going to be telling you about uh, our work on Parkinson's disease, because it's come the farthest. So Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease. It's, uh, the patients present with motor defects because of uh, the loss of dopamine producing the neurons in the substantia nigra, although uh, there is a, a bro much broader neuropathology which is beginning to be appreciated now. It, it hits the dopaminergic neurons uh, most severely and, and most rapidly. It's also distinguished by the presence of something called Lewy bodies, which are those big globs of protein that I just showed you, cytoplasmic pro uh, inclusions rich in aggregated proteins. And there's also uh, Parkinson's is a really fascinating disease because there's a bewildering variety of environmental influences that cause what looks like a Parkinson's disease. Um, for example, uh, mitochondrial toxins. Uh, there's some dreadful stories where the U.S. government actually sprayed, sprayed uh, things like Paraquat on marijuana plants, and the people who spoke that marijuana wound up coming down with Parkinson's disease. There are other uh, mitochondrial toxins that ca can cause Parkinson's as well. Um, most cases of Parkinson's seem to be sporadic, but there's certainly a few cases where it's hereditary because it occurs early in, in families, specific families. So there's probably, in most cases, a genetic component and an environmental component, and they're mixed up in a variety of different ways. Alpha-synuclein is the single most abundant protein in those Lewy bodies. And it's a small protein of unknown function. We know it likes to bind membranes. Uh, there's been some interesting work from Tom Sudoff's lab suggesting it might be a chaperone at the membrane, but we really don't really understand what it's doing. But it is true that, at least in a small number of families, if you have mutation in that protein, uh, you will get early onset Parkinson's disease. So it's one of the genetic factors that predisposes you to Parkinson's disease. So our idea was, okay, there's a, some kind of protein misfolding problem going on. We, we know how to study protein misfolding problems best in yeast than any other organism. So let's try to put this protein into yeast and see what happens, see if we can get some purchase on studying this problem. So we put one copy of alpha-synuclein into yeast cells. Uh, and by the way, we, we took advantage of this galactose-inducible promoter, 
uh, so that we can turn on the gene anytime we want to. Normally, when we're growing these, these cells, they, they're not making alpha synuclein. So that's very good because it allows us to do all sorts of genetic manipulations without any, any toxic pressures operating on them. And we just turn this gene on whenever we want to. And we visualize the protein by hooking it up to GFP. I'll just tell you that we've always go back, not always, but with most of the things I'll tell you, we go back and we check how the alpha synuclein does without the GFP fusion, and the results are the same. We put in one copy of this protein, and uh, it, it goes to the plasma membrane. Uh, and that's not very surprising. It seems to be involved in vesicle trafficking. You see it on vesicles that are moving towards the ends of synapses uh, and sometimes sit at the ends of synapses in, in neurons. But um, yeast doesn't regulate that step. It doesn't block those, those uh, particular uh, vesicles. And so you would expect it to ride out to the plasma membrane. And that's what it does. It's out there in the plasma membrane. And then going back to this idea I was talking to you about earlier in the lecture that um, proteins are misfolding and misbehaving in cells all the time, and that normally we have quality control mechanisms that help to take care of that. But maybe one of, some of the ideas are that in, as neurons age, and our neurons have to live a long, long, long time, as neurons age, problems with protein folding start to accumulate and get worse and worse and worse, and that you might sort of go over a precipice. So we decided to try putting in just an extra copy of alpha synuclein to see if we would, in a normal yeast cell, just mimic this fact that you could overload the system. And in fact, there was a very dramatic overloading. There was a complete relocalization of the protein in the yeast cells. And notice it's not just that the extra protein uh, winds up accumulating in these foci, but you wind up losing the protein at the plasma membrane as well. It winds up accumulating in these same foci. And well. What happens to the cells? Well, if these are simple growth curves, um, vector loan versus one copy of alpha synuclein, they don't really aren't bothered by that one copy of alpha synuclein very much at all. They grow pretty much the same rate. Two copies. Uh, they double once, and that's it. And in fact, what's really nice about this system is because we're turning it on with galactose, we can actually start to monitor what events happen first, what happens second, what happens third, et cetera. And it's only about here, after about 10 hours, that the cells are starting to really die. Now, there have been, uh, as many of you know, uh, long-standing associations between oxidative damage and neurodegenerative diseases. And we can monitor oxidative damage in yeast cells very simply because there are these little fluorescent dyes that you can add to the cells, which will not fluoresce unless they're hit with a reactive oxygen species. So we simply incubated the yeast cells in the presence of these dyes. And as you can see here, before we turn on alpha-synuclein, the cells are fine. Or if we expose them to galactose with a vector alone, they're fine. But if they're making alpha-synuclein, they are just raging with reactive oxygen species after about 10 hours. This is when they're starting to die. That actually turns out to be one of the later events. It's not the first thing we see happening that goes wrong. There were a lot of other similarities between what was happening in these yeast cells and what, what people have reported in neurons that I'm not going to have time to tell you about. You can look up the papers if you want. But this was one of the ones that I was really the most amazed at. Um, we were correcting the proofs on our paper uh, on this, and my student walked into my office and said, you know, I've just come back from this meeting on Parkinson's disease, and it turns out that there's this family uh, that has been, a group of families, in fact, that have been studied at, at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, because they get early onset Parkinson's disease. And it was really a puzzle. This particular group of families were a real puzzle because it seemed the, the predisposition seemed to map to the alpha-synuclein locus, but when they cloned out the locus, it was perfectly normal. So this is, was, in terms of amazing co correlation between our yeast work and, uh, and incredible coincidences that happened that exactly it was discovered exactly the same time, it turns out that the reason these people uh, got early onset Parkinson's disease uh, uh, can be discerned by uh, hybridization experiments and then later by gels. It turns out that these people have gotten a duplication of the alpha synuclein locus on one chromosome. So they're actually making exactly, have du du so they have three copies of the gene on one chrom chromosome, one copy on the other, they're making twice as much of this alpha synuclein protein, and they die of Parkinson's disease. So we've, of course, taken advantage of yeast, then, that's to do high-throughput uh, methodologies to try to see if we can uh, 
uh, find some things that, that might make a difference in, in this toxicity. And um, the first thing we, well, we, we did a lot of different things. One of the things we did more recently, actually, was to take advantage of a new library in yeast that um, puts every single open reading frame of yeast under the control of that same galactose-inducible promoter. So now we can transform yeast cells with this entire library. So in every one of our wells, we have a different, uh, we have a, the same strain of yeast. They're all expressing alpha-synuclein. We're actually, we've tuned down the level of expression a little bit here, so it's not quite as toxic, so we can look for both things that help make the cells get better or make the cells get worse. And one by one, we transform different genes in there, and we ask for every single gene in the genome, what makes the cells feel better, what makes the cells feel worse. Here's some examples of the data. Uh, this cell is carrying a plasmid uh, that produces a protein that helps correct the defect. This one is carrying one that makes it sicker. Uh, this well is empty. So we have now screened 5,000 genes, and we've got 60 modifiers. And they're turning out to be very, very interesting. The first class is simply proof of principle. Things that are involved in turning on the galactose promoter, uh, if you hit those, it makes the cells better. Not interesting, but proof of principle. But we saw all kinds of genes that are involved in vesicle trafficking, and that's interesting because alpha synuclein has been postulated to be involved in vesicle trafficking. Manganese transport was really, is really interesting because I mentioned lots of idiosyncratic uh, environmental influences that can cause Parkinson's. One of them is that miners who mine the metal manganese, but not miners of most other metals, get early onset Parkinson's disease. So I, I don't know if this is going to turn out to be just a red herring or true, but whether we might be able to study this odd connection between Parkinson's disease and manganese uh, in yeast. We see things involved in nitrosative stress and oxidative stress, protein quality control. But even things that are of unknown function, I think, are going to turn out to be a jackpot. Because a couple of the genes that are involved in, that are known to, when mutated to cause early onset Parkinson's disease don't have a known function. And one of those is a very close homologue of one of our genes in yeast, which is also annotated as being a gene of unknown function but a very, very highly conserved protein clearly doing this, must be doing, performing the same function in yeast cells. So that's you know, something we pick out of a high-throughput screen in yeast is validated in a human disease model. I just want to tell you about one other hit from the screen. Uh, the, the obvious thing is you see these things in yeast and you want to validate them in other models. So oh, we took our hits from the screen. One of, I'm, I'm only going to show you one of them. But we took one of the things which saves yeast cells from alpha-synuclein. We tested it in a worm model of Parkinson's disease, where the worms are expressing alpha-synuclein and dopaminergic neurons. We tested it in a fruit fly model, where they're expressing alpha-synuclein and dopaminergic neurons. And it rescues both of those. This was done with Nancy Benini and this with Guy Caldwell. But the one piece of data I am going to show you is something we did with Chris Roche, in which he takes embryonic cells from rat midbrain, puts them into a culture, and exposes them either to viruses that will make them make alpha-synuclein, or exposes them to environmental toxins that can cause early onset Parkinson's. And he sees that the dopaminergic neurons are particularly sensitive to this. So does the gene that's involved in vesicle trafficking that rescues the yeast cells rescue these neurons? Yes, it does. So this is a specific number of the percentage of dopaminergic neurons in the culture to begin with, after alpha-synuclein expression, a random gene co-expressed, our vesicle trafficking gene co-expressed. So we get a tremendous rescue of this phenotype, and the cell morphology is rescued as well. So the next thing we did was to take advantage, and this is the very last thing I'm going to be telling you about. We took advantage of this fact that you know, there's a huge growth deficit in these cells with alpha-synuclein. So we simply asked what, what chemical compounds might have the capacity to rescue these cells. So um, this is a really cool screen. Because it's yeast cells, we can grow the cells very quickly and very cheaply. And we can screen 150,000 compounds in a matter of a few weeks. We had three goals in one. First of all, as I told you, we've got about 60 modifiers. Figuring out what the right target it is to go after in terms of 
helping to ameliorate the toxicity of mis misfunctioning alpha-synuclein, it, it's kind of hard to choose. So our idea was just let the yeast cells tell us what will make them better. Um, the second thing was that by living, using a living yeast cell instead of a biochemical assay, say a lot of people are doing things like looking for compounds that might help to mis prevent the misfolding of alpha-synuclein. But the trouble when you do an in vitro assay like that is that often the compounds you get won't wind up getting into cells. And the third thing is that when they do get into cells, they can often kill the cells. They might fix, they might hit that kinase, they might do whatever it was you were trying to do, but when they actually get into a cell, they might have some other toxic activity. So we just simply ask for things that would restore viability and, in three, and have accomplish all three of those goals at once. And we got seven compounds that work. They all fix a, a vesicle trafficking defect in the cells. And most importantly, uh, they work in the rat uh, midbrain cultures to rescue dopaminergic neurons. And they work in, in the nematode neurons as well. And what's really almost too good to be true, and it, it might not be true, it's only preliminary, it's only been done three times. But remember I told you there's all sorts of other kinds of factors that can cause Parkinson's disease, and we don't really know how closely these might be related to alpha-synuclein biology, like mitochondrial poisons, mitochondrial toxins. So our chemical compounds also are rescuing these neurons from rotenone-induced toxicity. So this is the loss of dopaminergic neurons due to exposure to this mitochondrial poison rotenone, and these are two different compounds. They're not giving complete rescue, but they're giving really quite substantial rescue. So if this is true, it really will help not only uh, be potential route to the discovery of new drugs that might be useful, but also it, it really is of biological interest because it shows us that these, these very diverse things are really related to alpha-synuclein biology. And so I'll just close by saying I hope that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that we can use yeast cells to model lots of different diseases. I want to emphasize very strongly that I'm not delusional and I don't have the, uh, I don't have the, the concept that, you know, that a yeast cell is just as good of a, as a neuron. Um, we have to just move, use yeast as a discovery platform and move as quickly as possible into neurons to really validate anything we see. But I'm hoping that yeast cells can help us out in this regard. And I just want to show you the people uh, that were involved in this research. Uh, Tiago Tiro set up the synuclein model. Anil set up the screening. Aaron Gittler finished it and has done a lot of other additional analysis since then. Um, and then these are a bunch of other people that are involved in other aspects of our yeast um, disease discovery platform. And uh, these are our collaborators. What's becoming the, you know, more and more apparent to me in science is that the technology is moving faster and faster and faster, and that having good collaborators to work with is, is absolute gold. And so these, these folks have been just absolutely fast fabulous to work with, and I've uh, mentioned them the earlier, those guys on those slide earlier, uh, and these were the guys who helped devise that library that we've been using, and Carolyn uh, helped us with our chemical screen at the Harvard Proteomics Center. Um, and this is our funding sources, so thank you very, very much. Before we ask questions, just remind you, we'll have a reception after this uh, uh, discussion. I'm sure now Sue is ready for questions. Yes. Um, in, in the last part, uh, I mean, you have this nice result where you put that second copy in and your cells stop growing. I mean, so what? And then you showed a little bit on how they accumulate oxidative stress. So is that oxidative stress the cause? Is it so, causal so in them from stop growing? The question was, um, in those cells where we're putting in an extra copy of alpha synuclein and stressing the system, and they start to accumulate reactive oxygen species, is it the reactive oxygen species that are actually, uh, killing, is actually killing the cells, or, or is that secondary? Very good question, and we can't quite tell. I can give you some aspects of the, of the picture. That actually happens, we don't see those, we, at least we don't see them in large amounts until quite late. We see defects in vesicle trafficking earlier. Uh, and we think that the vesicle trafficking defect is what leads to a problem with mitochondria, and that the problem with mitochondria which creates reactive oxygen species. 
We do, however, think that they're tied in with each other in terms of causing the toxicity. We, we, we found in that screen, I showed you one gene that really made the cells grow very, very well. We've got about 25 or 30 genes that are quite strong. They're, that's the, the single best. But amongst the others that are really quite strong are um, proteins that are involved in the, in, uh, the response to nitrosative stress and proteins that are involved in response to oxidative stress. So that tells me that the oxidative stress and the and nitrosative stress must also be contributing to the toxicity in those cases because by uh, promoting the response to those, those damages, you can at least partially save the cells. Now, none of our, I showed you the, the suppression in cells that have a reduced level of alpha synuclein, so we could either look for things that made the cells better or worse in the same screen, half of the work. But um, what we wanted to go back now and, do, and look to see in the super toxicity strain, the higher toxicity strain, how many of those can rescue the cells there. And what we see is we have not been able to find any single gene that can completely rescue there. They can make the cells grow better, but they don't return to fully normal levels. So now it's a case of putting everything back together two by two, and perhaps even three by three, and seeing how these different, different factors and different pathways synergize. Because I think um, the reason why this, this disease is a very complex, difficult disease to study, and there's so many different factors that seem to be able to cause it, is because it is, in fact, really biologically complex. There are lots of different pathways that get perturbed in, when alpha-synuclein is misfolding. And while vesicle trafficking seems to be one of the first things going wrong, it's not by any means the only thing. And you haven't repeated this in fatigues, right? Haven't repeated it in what? In uh, row zero fatigues. We have not repeated it in, in row zeros. And uh, that's one of the things. We have a, have a list of screens that we want to do, and that's one of the ones we want to do. Yes? Is there any evidence for um, uh, chaperonins working extra slow? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is there evidence that? That heat proteins or, or protein folding mechanisms happen to secreted proteins? That, uh, so is there any evidence that heat shock proteins and protein folding mechanisms, the last part your voice said. Secreted proteins. Oh, help with the secreted proteins? Oh, oh, are there extracellular, are there heat shock proteins that work out there? Yeah, there are some secreted heat shock proteins. There's some, some, some definitely some chaperones that work out extracellularly. And I think that we've only, that, that's just beginning to come out. We really don't know all of the, all of the ones that are out there, but yes. Those I don't, those are not, we don't have, have those in yeast, <laughs> so, sorry. In your uh, chemical library screen, you isolated eight compounds. Do they have similar structural features that might indicate that they might be targeting the same family of proteins or they are all diverse? So the chemical uh, compound hits, the seven hits, do they seem to be targeting the same thing or are, uh, do they look alike? At first we thought that they um, fell into two classes because it was even, I'm, I'm very untrained in uh, uh, this, but I, I, even I could see that we had three that looked quite a bit alike and four that looked quite a bit alike. Uh, and then we started to do SAR, structure activity relationship analysis, where we started putting different, different, went back to other libraries and looked for some similar compounds, for example, that were, were slightly different and had different groups on, the, on various places. And uh, even more of this has been done now in a, in a, in a company that I'm associated with. But uh, that analysis made us realize that although this compound, only half of it looked like the, uh, the other compound, when we put something in, in the same place in the ring, on the other compound, it also killed activity. If we put something over here, it didn't kill activity. So actually, I think that this is all one chemical class. Uh, since then, another screen has been done, not in my laboratory, because we wanted to use this as both as proof of principle and as to get some tools to help with the biology. And for example, I think that worked, because it's still a fairly preliminary result. But the fact that we were able to screen a compound library for things that affect alpha-synuclein toxicity in yeast and then go back and find that that helps to rescue the neurons from a mitochondrial poison um, that's been associated with Parkinson's it tells me that we really are hitting into this, the real biology of Parkinson's, and that those things are connected. So that was a useful biological tool for us. But I don't want to have my lab, people in my laboratory screening, going back and screening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of compounds. It's just something you need to do. So this company, has uh, Foldorex, has gone back and done that. They've screened about 400,000 additional compounds.
and they've come up with about five other chemical classes. And their mechanism of action is at this point still not known. Okay, everybody wants to have some wine, I guess. <laughs> the best product of yeast. <laughs>